answer those questions for you. So tonight we have with us Dr. Mike Ward, and he will be presenting on designing a garden to attract birds. Dr. Mike Ward is originally from Jacksonville, Illinois, and received his PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 2004. He is currently an associate professor in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences in the College of Agriculture, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Illinois, and an ornithologist with the Illinois Natural History Survey. He and his students are working on a variety of projects throughout the Midwest, but also in Texas, Mexico, and Cuba. In summary, Dr. Ward studies the ecology and behavior of birds in the natural and modified ecosystems in order to inform conservation and management. Welcome, Dr. Ward. Thank you for presenting to us this evening. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to, uh, to give this presentation. Um, so thanks for the nice introduction. So um, as you might have guessed, I'm a bird person, not a plant person per se, but um, my father was a, owned a nursery for years when I was young. And, and so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why birds will come to your backyard and then how to design a garden to attract birds. And it's a good time to think about this. I mean, um, hopefully the pandemic is coming toward an end here soon. Um, but during the pandemic, there's been um, a lot of interest. So people in shelter and home, you can only stay home so long. The use of our natural areas throughout Illinois has greatly increased and not just in Illinois, throughout the world. Um, we have different citizen science programs that people can enter bird sightings into and the number of people entering and the number of sightings has gone you know, through the roof. And so, um, you know, as this pandemic's hopefully calming down and you know, as spring is coming, it's a great time to think about birds, um, what birds can, uh, you can have in your backyard. And even though most of you are probably in, in Northern Illinois, um, I would imagine you already had reveling blackbirds and robins coming to your, to your yards and it's just gonna get, the weather looks good for the migration in the next couple of weeks. And so we're lucky in Illinois in that we have lots of birds that we can see in our backyard. So this is a short list or short, um, a few pictures of birds that um, depending on kind of what kind of yard you have, um, you can have these birds. And I would, I would hazard a guess that the majority of you um, have the majority of these birds in your yard, whether you know it or not. And so we're gonna talk about what birds are we attracting? Why would they stop in your yard? So I think that's important to think about. Um, what are they doing in your yard? So if we know what they're doing in your yard, then um, we can do things for them to make their lives a little easier. Um, the habitats that attract and keep birds in your yard, um, gardening or management, kind of depending on the scale of your yard, um, threats that birds face and ways that we might be able to mitigate those threats, and a little bit about the future might hold in the context of birds in your backyard. Um, and so the reason why birds might stop in your backyard is varied. So some birds are breeding back there. So right now you might have morning doves are starting to get cranked up to start um, and they'll start even up in Northern Illinois start making a nest here in a couple of weeks. You have birds that are leaving your yard right now, birds that came down in the winter. So like juncos or American tree sparrows, um, finches of some kind, sometimes purple finches. And then you have the migrants, birds that's passing through. Um, and those will be showing up here soon. And we're kind of in the cross um, crossroads, right? So there, a lot of them are coming from maybe South America, heading to the Arctic, and they're just stopping over in Illinois for a couple of days. So a little bit about backyard birds. So this is a morning dove. Morning doves are one of the really common backyard birds. They don't build much of a nest, but here's one that um, sitting on a nest. Cardinal, chipping sparrows, house sparrows, starlings, finches, uh, cooper's hawks that might be eating these uh, morning doves and Robin. So all of these, um, no matter kind of what, how big your yard is, there's ways to make it more uh, appealing for breeding birds. Um, most of these birds aren't really conservation of concern species, but still, you know, it's great to have these in your yard and um, to observe them. In the winter, um, you know, we're lucky to have a whole suite of different species. So uh, cardinals will still be around because they don't migrate anywhere, but Juncos, white-throated sparrows, um, woodpeckers, most of those in Illinois aren't migratory, so they'll be in your backyard. And then this picture right here is of pine siskins. So this has been a remarkable year, winter, for northern finches. 
So this bird breeds in boreal forests, and depending on the amount of seeds in the boreal forest, some years it doesn't come to Illinois, but this year they've come down in big numbers along with a couple other species. And so, um, you know, feeding birds in winter is a good way to observe a lot of the birds that might be in your yard and hard to observe um, without them coming to the feeder. Um, and then migratory birds. These are my favorite birds. I'll talk a little bit about some of the research we have going on these. But, you know, I live on a little town just outside Urbana and um, in my yard during, you know, April and May, you get all kinds of cool birds. This bird right here is a rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, I'm sure all of you have these coming through your yard, whether you see them or not. Lots of warblers, thrushes, tanagers, catbirds, all these are migratory birds, which means that they spent the winter somewhere south. Um, the case of like Swainson's thrushes, they would have been in the Amazon, a northern part of the Amazon, and they're going to breed in the boreal forest, but they're going to stop over in your yard for a day or two on their way. Other birds don't go nearly as far, so like catbirds are, are hanging out in the Gulf Coast, um, primarily Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, toward Texas, and then they come back up and, they'll, and they will breed around here, but some of them go farther north. And so I don't know if you thought much about this, but um, millions of birds migrate across our, our skies every night. So the majority of birds are nocturnal migrants, meaning they, and once it gets uh, dark, they fly up in the sky and, and start heading whatever direction they went ahead. Um, this figure on the on the right side here, this is next rad radar. So if you ever watch your local forecast, I'll have an next rad radar talking about some storms coming in. But in this figure here, these are obviously storms, but all these areas around these different next rad stations, these are all migratory birds. Um, sometimes your local weather forecaster will say, oh, this is ground clutter. Usually he's wrong. So what happens is birds fly faster than um, the weather systems move. And so um, NOAA, um, the organization that runs these um, next red radar stations, um, has a filter. It filters the data. And so things are moving fast. They don't show it for your local forecasters. But we can look at these. And so in this case right here, this is from central Illinois, um, Springfield, Decatur, Clinton, areas along the Illinois River. And so this is where they all got up at night. And so you notice. These are areas where we still have forest. So I have some um, other figures that are not quite as good that show when the sun goes down, areas around Bloomington, Springfield, uh, along the Illinois River Valley, up toward Rockford. Um, these urban areas are where the trees are, right? Because most of Illinois is corn and soybeans. And so that's where the birds are. And so they're eating in your backyard all day. And then they need, um, they fly all night. They can fly a long way. So we track birds from Urbana to Eau Claire, Wisconsin in a night. We tried to rob in south from Urbana to Jackson, Mississippi in one night. So they can fly a long ways in a night. But when the sun comes up, they got to figure out where to go. And so this is what a phenomenon we see in Illinois quite often. Sun comes up, they're out over a big open area of corn and soybeans, and they need somewhere they can get food and shelter and be safe. Uh, so food is, well, fat essentially, is the uh, fuel for migration. And so what we can do in our backyards is provide landscaping and plants and food that allows them to get fat. Um, so they put the fat on and then they can migrate. Um, and so what are birds doing all day during migration? Essentially they fly all night and then um, they eat as much as they can during the day and maybe rest a little bit toward the end of the day. And so what we want is fat birds. This is a figure, we did some research um, where we would track birds from up here, which is by um, um, Gulf Shores, Alabama, near Mobile, Alabama. We put transmitters on birds and then we um, developed an array of recording stations across the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. These are the tracks that birds took and you can see the different, um, the, the bigger the ball, the faster they're flying. Um, you know, they run into different headwinds and that kind of stuff. But what it told us was that we need fat birds. So, um, and we, we can kind of all do our part. So it'll kind of, um, what we're doing in Illinois impacts what birds are doing, uh, whether they're able to cross the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a long story, but I got left on a, on a essentially abandoned island in the Caribbean one day because the Mexican government forgot to pick me up. And so the morning I didn't, didn't well, I didn't have much to do the whole time. But in the morning I was walking around and what you would see is dead birds floating up. So this is a uh, pathonotary warbler that flew up 
And uh, we know from research from shark bellies in the Gulf of Mexico that the number one content of some of the sharks is dead birds. And these birds aren't landing on the water or the sharks aren't jumping out of the water. These birds are flying across the Gulf of Mexico, running out of fat and falling into the water and getting eaten. And so um, one thing that I'm really um, pushing these days is you know, having a gar garden that allows our birds to get fat. And we'll talk about that more throughout the course of this presentation. All right, so the next question is, what are they doing in your yard? So we just talked a little bit about their eating, but they're also sleeping and some are nesting. And so all these things are important to think about. And so if they're eating, the question is, what are they eating? So in the winter, most birds are eating seeds, but it should be noted that, you know, if you have some nut hatches or chickadees, um, especially if you're farther in southern Illinois, there's still insects out there. Um, they are feeding in insects along the bark. They're looking around in the ground for insects. Um, there's a lot of hardy insects that um, can still make it in winter and they're eating. But throughout um, spring and summer, it's mostly insects, right? That's what they're feeding on. In fall, though, they switch over and fruit becomes really important. And that's one of the things that we um, found out in the study tracking birds is that they eat a lot, a lot of fruit. And so the plants you plant in your yard can provide the fruit that they need for their migration. Um, sleeping, right? So having dent, dent shrubs and cavities, um, you know, especially when that really cold snap happened a couple of weeks ago, um, cavity nesting birds like this Carolina wren or bluebirds all like to get in cavities and try to stay warm. And so providing lots of, of cover is obviously a really good thing for birds. I mean, this is burning bush, which isn't a native bush, but we'll talk more about native versus exotic species here in a, in a second. And then breeding, right? So sometimes they breed in spots like you don't, don't want, such as robin breeding on this person's guttering. Um, sometimes you got to put out boxes like purple martin boxes. Other times having cavities out there, bluebird boxes. Um, you know, there's a whole suite of areas where birds can breed. And, you know, having more um, structure, which I'll talk about here in a second, in your yard can be um, what birds are looking for in order to breed. All right, so we know what they're doing in your yard. They're eating, they're sleeping, they're maybe trying to reproduce. But, um, you know, what habitats do we need to attract and keep these birds in our yards? And it really comes down to structure. So this is a picture from a, actually in Wisconsin. But um, what I want you to notice here is, you know, you have some bigger trees, some smaller trees, some, um, you know, small bushes on the ground. You got some open areas, you got some grasses. What birds, birds are kind of interesting in that they don't really need super specific plants. Um, you know, lots of different plants will work. They just need structure. And so um, this is a back picture I found on the internet of a backyard that I thought was great because it shows structure, right? So obviously someone, you know, is living out there, they can eat outside. You have lots of ornamental flowers, good structure. You got bigger trees, you got smaller trees. Um, so this is essentially going to provide not maybe as some species won't like this, but a lot of forest birds that, excuse me, that we have in Illinois are going to love to be in this um, area just as much as they would like to be in a, you know, a real forest. And so we got to think about the different layers. You got the canopy, um, the emergent layer on top, you got the canopy, you got the understory layer, and you got the forest floor. So a lot of these we can replicate in our yards. Um, the forest floor is, in my opinion, by far the hardest to really get at. Um, but, you know, given um, the right soils and, and the right um, size of your yard, you can get at this as well. And so the goal is to attain structure, layers. We want to do native shrubs, trees, and grasses and forbs, though there definitely are some non-native plants that work fine and aren't, we're not too worried about them getting out into the natural habitats and causing a problem. And um, I sent a PDF of this uh, to Nikki. And so I'm going to go through the, a lot of these plants pretty quick. Um, and depending on where you are in the state, some of these plants do better than others. But um, this is just some of the shrubs that we like to put out there. Um, some of the ones I'll point out, I, I really like serviceberry, amulanker. There's actually several um, different types of serviceberry, but they put on berries. Um, they have good fall color. Um, they have lots of good flowers. Um, Chokeberry, another good small shrub that wildlife like. Pokeberry, we'll talk about in a second. These viburnums and dogwoods, really good dense cover for lots of species. Um, even sumac, um, people don't think about sumac very much, but sumac um, berries are used by certain um, birds certain times of year. 
And so you, it comes up this question. You know, a lot of people in the audience might think pokeberry is a weed, right? So it comes up in your backyard. Their berries are poisonous to humans. I, I mean, I, I don't know much about this, but my understanding is they probably won't kill you, but they're, you just shouldn't eat a lot of them. They're just going to make you sick. Um, but at the same time, um, we know from lots of our research now, so now these days, if we catch a bird, so we catch birds in nets, and we, that's how we put our transparents on them. Um, and one of the first things birds typically do when you catch them in nets is poop on you. So you can get a fecal sample. And with genetic tools now, we can run that fecal sample through um, some genetic tools and determine what they're feeding on. And so a lot of birds like to eat pokeberry. Here's a, a gray catbird eating um, pokeberry. Here's a black-throated green warbler. Here's some young bluebirds. And so you'll notice um, when you see these in the fall, lots of these are gone, right? Um, so you can tell which plants birds like better best by how quickly their berries are gone. So I think the the number one is service berry. So I have a service berry right in front of my living room and I don't think that berries make it a week once they're ripe. I mean, they're just absolutely full of birds eating those because they have high core, high calories, a lot of nutrition. Um, they're just a really desirable berry. And, you know, the good thing about service berry is you can eat them as well. So um, um, people put them on ice cream and that kind of stuff. Uh, bush honeysuckle, right? So the big question is, is um, is this the evil exotic species or the habitat and the important thing for birds? Um, now, you, I will, well, it's, it's complex, right? So I've worked with a lot of different organizations that have gotten rid of their honeysuckle. And then typically they work with me after the honeysuckle is gone. And they're like, well, where all the birds go? We got rid of this evil species and the birds are all gone. Well, the problem is you got to replace it with native shrubs. And so this can be challenging. Um, you know, we work in Chicagoland area sometimes and the deer are so abundant that you just can't get shrubs going because the, the deer eat them all. And so before you cut out honeysuckle, you got to think about what you're going to put in there. Also, the berries aren't exactly ideal. Um, so you'll notice if you look out, you know, late winter or midwinter, sometimes there's a lot of honeysuckle berries left because it's the last thing birds are eat because there's not a lot of nutrition in there. It's enough to keep a robin alive or maybe a hermit thrush, but um, they're really not desirable. Um, However, they do provide a lot of cover for nesting. And again, if you get rid of them all and you don't really work to try to restore native shrubs, then you're gonna lose the birds that they rely on shrubs. I mentioned before service berry, again, a great tree for uh, birds like this. This is a cedar waxwing um, that, you know, just absolutely love um, service berries. And this is a blue grosbeak that also takes advantage of the, um, the ripe uh, service berries. And again, you know they're good when they disappear so fast. Um, and so we're actually got a project on campus right now. We're working the Arboretum in a natural area. And I just bought a bunch of service berry um, for a um, student group that wants to do restoration to plant in certain areas to try to restore habitat for wildlife. And um, we should be getting our, our service berries here soon and um, getting out there and you know, a couple of years we'll have good habitat for migratory birds. All right, trees. So by far the most important trees are hardwoods, oaks like this, right? So I'm not a big fan of the mowing underneath oaks, but in this case, this oak tree is gonna support lots of birds because hardwoods support a lot more insects like these Lepidoptera, so these caterpillars here. And those are what birds really need. Um, so hardwoods like oaks, hickories, even some, some trees we might not call hardwoods like uh, locusts, tulip trees, um, cherry, hackberry, these are by far support the most insects, which therefore support the most birds. Um, you know, when I walk around during spring migration, some of the students in my class are like, well, how did you know birds are going to be in this tree? And I'm like, well, it's a big oak. I mean, the oaks and hickories just support a lot more Lepidoptera. And we're doing some studies right now on whippoorwills. So whippoorwills you probably don't have in your backyard and they're kind of hard to get your backyard, but it's a forest bird and they're quickly disappearing from all of Illinois. They're gone from all areas around Champaign. Where I grew up in Western Illinois, they're gone from my dad's property. Um, we still have a few areas where we still have whippoorwills, but we've been doing research on why they're gone and it, it's all about insects. So this figure right here is all on the left is all moths that um, we capture. This is a, we put out these traps at night and catch insects. This is up by Kinkakee Sands, which is up by Kinkakee and huge numbers of insects at night. And that leads to why they have whippoorwills. 
Um, where I live here in Champaign County, I'll put a trap out at night and I'll get a few June bugs and a few cabbage white butterflies. And so maybe the um, insects are gone because of agricultural chemicals. And so we're still investigating that. And it's, in my mind, it's probably one of the factors that's why the insects are gone. But you know, at the same time, having lots of plants that support um, insects is also uh, a really good thing to do. And I've been um, trying to learn more about that and trying to do it in my own yard. And you know, there's not a lot of known about some of these insects, but at the same time, it's you know, it's pretty clear more structure and more native plants lead to more insects. Um, some more trees that are good. A lot of these are producing seeds. Um, you know, chestnut, um, obviously it's got some, there's some new varieties of that that are, are resistant to the blight. Um, oaks, pawpaw, a lot of these are good. The lower quality trees are generally ash, maples, and elms. Now, it's still better to have those than have nothing, but I mean, ash right now is in bad shape, right? Because the Dutch um, emerald ash borer and then elms with uh, Dutch elm disease. Um, and maples just don't support as much insects. They don't support as much wildlife as other ones. Um, we do, we have been doing a lot of work with um, cities in Chicago, suburbs of Chicago, about with their foresters on what trees to plant for birds. And, you know, you can get ash trees cheap because they're all going to die. And there's definitely places, um, subdivisions in um, the greater Chicagoland area where the developer put in all ash trees, they all died, which actually right now is not terrible because the woodpeckers are using them. But um, before they'd all died, there, there's just not that many birds there. And so, um, you know, oaks and hickories grow slower, but they still grow pretty fast, all right? So, I mean, we all want instantaneous trees in our, our yards. Um, and definitely some of the trees will grow faster than others. But once they get established, I mean, oaks, they're not super slow. I mean, they, they grow pretty fast. Um, you know, I always get the question about native versus exotic versus cultivars. Um, you know, pine trees are pretty much not native to Illinois, except in a couple of rare situations. Eastern cedars are, you know, use our body, mountain ash, all those aren't native. But um, a lot of these we know really don't, are, don't get out in nature, right? And so um, there's definitely, in your local nursery can help with this, trees that, um, you know, can, you can plant to help wildlife that maybe aren't native per se, but aren't going to be a problem um, going forward. At least we don't think so. Okay, a little bit about um, gardening, feeders, those kind of things. So first off, a question I get about gardening is, is bird feeders, the influence of bird feeders. And so my typical answer to this is that um, it's, they're pretty benign, right? And so you know, a couple weeks ago when it was super cold, maybe you kept a few birds alive that may have otherwise died. But generally speaking, when I do conservation work, we work on population levels. Um, and so on a population level, it's probably making, not making a huge difference either way. And so I think the, the greatest benefit of bird feeders is letting people see birds, right? Um, enjoy it, understand them. I mean, people will don't care about nature, care about conservation, or care about the outdoors if they don't under, know what it is, right? And so having a bird feeder and letting young people look at birds, I think is a great thing. The only species that may actually, um, you know, its population is related, are related to, um, oops, related to, uh, let's see if this works, I might not work. Oh, it's working. Um, it's hummingbirds. So this is a group of hummingbirds that migrate from Mexico and Central America up through Illinois. And we, um, we did some work with these where we tracked them around the Gulf of Mexico, because theoretically they could fly the thousand kilometers across the Gulf of Mexico, but they don't. They all go around. And we found out that what they do is, let's see when it gets to uh, October, November. So they all come up through the you other know, in your backyard, feeding in your you know, uh, honeysuckles or whatever you have in your backyard. Then they come down and instead of going across, they all go along this and they're going down to people that are essentially snowbirds, right? They take your trailer down to Texas or Louisiana for the winter and they have a hummingbird feeder out and they just bounce their way around the Gulf of Mexico. And so that's really changed, I think, some of the migratory patterns of hummingbirds, um, which is not a bad thing. It's just, you know, birds taking advantage of what they, what they can. Um, and so for people that are itching for spring, I would bet the first hummingbird is back in Illinois and about, well, in Southern Illinois, in about, mm, I would say, three weeks to four weeks, something like that. And up your way, you're going to have to wait till the last week in April, uh, first week in May. 
Um, a little bit about mowing. So uh, there's some interesting books out there on why we mow so much. And if you do um, some social science work on asking people why they mow, it's very interesting, right? So um, some of my neighbors have big yards they mow and I go talk to the, the person mowing them and they're like, ah, I just spent three hours mowing, I hate doing it. And there's a simple answer to that, right? Don't do it, right? So what it, um, I'm a big proponent of no mow, um, trying to reduce early season mowing. So letting stuff grow up early in the season to support whether it's um, snakes or mammals or birds. Um, and then, you, I mean, you can mow it later in the season, but letting stuff um, grow up is, uh, is a big thing. But again, it's, it's really it comes down to a cultural thing. Um, there's some great work on, you know, why people in the U.S. Um, mow so much going back to people coming back over, coming over to the United States from Europe, primarily Britain, and trying to replicate the manners, you know, the perfectly manicured manners over there. And it's so ingrained in our culture, um, you know, like mowing along roadsides. So one of my friends with DNR is in charge of the Roadsides for Wildlife program. And, you know, it's just an uphill fight. Um, where I grew up, we don't have any Bob White anymore. And our neighbor um, will say, well, I saw you haven't mowed your roadside, took care of it for you. And he's been doing this for 40 years. And, you know, you tell him, and he realizes the reason we don't have Bob White is because they have no way to move around anymore without getting eaten. But people just can't, <laughs> the, our neighbor physically cannot help himself. He, he cannot stand to see grass not mowed, even though he complains about constantly. So, you know, one thing I do in my class on campus, I teach a couple of different courses, is talk to, you know, this 20 year olds about, you know, if you have your house, you know, think about this, you don't need to mow, right? So it's only gonna change as the culture changes. Um, leaves are another one, right? So there's a, some great research out of New York this year on showing that if you leave the leaves down, you can maybe mulch them up a little bit, but leaving leaves in some areas support a good insect community, which then um, birds will feed in. And so this is an oven bird that's feeding on insects. I did a little experiment in my backyard where the very back of it, I just blew some leaves instead of, instead of mulching up, I just put them all on my back fence and then was watching to see what would happen during fall migration. And lots of uh, white-throated sparrows, hermit thrushes, fox sparrows, all would go in there and root around looking for insects. Um, I, initially, I hadn't thought there would be that many insects that can make it just by having a few leaves out there. But apparently, there's quite a few insects that essentially have evolved to take advantage of these fallen leaves. And leaving them there for a little bit um, is good. I mean, obviously, it will kill your grass if you leave lots of leaves out there. But a lot of us have areas where our grass doesn't grow well anyway. And it's like, which, what's why I did it. And so if the grass is not gonna grow, I'm not gonna try to grow it and I'm just gonna make more habitat for wildlife. Um, breeding areas, dead trees and, and birdhouses. So I'm a big part of dead trees. We have lots of dead ash around, dead elms around. Um, you know, my yard, I had a couple of dead trees in the front yard and my, one of my neighbors was coming over asking, well, I can cut it down for you, don't worry about it. I'm like, I don't wanna cut it down. You know, I have a couple of years where it's gonna fall down. It was by my driveway. So I needed to make sure it didn't fall down on my any cars. But it, I had easy a couple of years before I ended up having to take down myself. Um, and so, you know, there is liability issues. We always talk to cities. Cities are always very, as soon as a tree is dead, they want it out of there. But there's definitely a benefit to leaving some dead trees around. And then birdhouses are great, right? So whether it's for house wrens, bluebirds, um, Carolina wrens, chickadees, all those. I mean, they need cavities, right? And given that we cut down so many dead trees um, as soon as we can, providing more cavities for them is a great way to um, help, those, help those species. All right, a little bit about threats. So the first one is cats. So cats are always a controversial issue. Um, they eat, you know, worldwide, maybe a billion birds, maybe more than a billion birds a year. You know, bells don't work. I mean, all in all, the way to deal with them is keep them inside. Um, you know, so there's a big, Audubon's got a big program to try to keep um, cats inside. And so people have done research where they just had owners that had cats that are outside that would come in for the night and how often they'd bring something dead. You know, cats will bring and bring back to you and extract like that out the number of cats out in the world. It's a number that are being killed. And so, and not just birds, but we work here on campus. Um, so we took transmitters, beep, beep, and we frequency modulate them. So they're now FM radio. And we put that around their collar. And so it transmit back to essentially a radio. And I was quantifying the death screams of whatever they ate to try to see if I can determine what they all killed. Well, it went on for about a week. We're getting some death screams, but every cat we caught was, we thought a feral cat. Mean as, you know, just wants to rip your head off. 
out in the South Farms living, you know, by a barn, you know, we didn't think it had an owner. Almost all those cats ended up going to someone's house and someone feed them. And then we, you know, inadvertently recorded people's conversations while they were talking to the cats or feeding the cats. Well, you know, one of the deans found out about that and all of a sudden like, well, we can't be recording people's conversations, even though there's a leash law for cats. So theoretically, you can't let your cat wander around, you know, the campus of U of I without a leash. But we had to stop that research because they're afraid of lawsuits. But in the, in the short amount of data we got, they're eating lots of stuff, not just birds. They're eating uh, lots of mice and other mammals that make crazy screams and they're getting attacked. Also, you know, thinking about backyards, there's also, you know, you know, I think about a good, but you know, there obviously is the bad, right? So um, as you create, create more natural habitats, you're gonna have more issues with whether it's deer or other birds trying to live in your house or in your house. And, um, but it's just a trade off, right? And so, um, you know, it's hard to have it both the best of both worlds where you wanna have the wildlife you wanna see, but you don't wanna have the wildlife that's getting in your trash or, you know, eating all your shrubbery if you have deer, those kind of things. Uh, window kills is another big issue. This picture on the left is we got a big initiative on campus where we're, uh, we had undergrads pick up birds this year and they had a huge amount of birds. This is, I think this is from Toronto, but again, birds run into windows and, you know, we can do great stuff in their yard to make it better for birds um, and better for wildlife in general. But then if the birds hit your window, it's bad. Um, not all of them die, but a large percent of them die. And the reason why birds hit windows is they see reflections of trees. Um, or the open sky. Um, so that reflection of trees is um, happens, a lot of times what happens is they see an opening and they wanna fly through it. Um, sometimes they see a reflection in like a rear view mirror, but that's really a different question. So that's when cardinals or um, sometimes woodpeckers are really hopped up on testosterone this time of year for nesting and a male sees a rival and just beats its head against a window. Typically, if you put like a bag over those windows for or mirrors, for a, a day or two, they'll, they'll stop. Um, planting, having a lot of indoor plants by windows can be a big problem, but this is primarily only a problem in Chicago, downtown Chicago, where there's not a lot of trees. And so the only trees are inside foyers of fancy high rises and they fly into those. I'm um, seeing through multiple windows to the open sky is a big issue. Um, like in my house, we, I had some problems with birds flying in the windows. I just moved around a couple of pieces of furniture, and so they can't really see all the way through now. And I, I still have birds in my windows, but most of the time it's because they're coming to my bird feeder, and a Cooper's hawk is flushing them. And Cooper's hawk has learned to kind of flush them into a house. I've seen this on multiple occasions, and that's why um, that happens. And there are also threats at night. So birds will fly toward bright lights, uh, lighthouse or communication towers and fly into those. But those really aren't things that you gotta worry about in your backyard. Um, the way to stop this is lighting behind the windows, right? So try to make it so that it doesn't look like they can fly through there. There are decals, UV decals. So birds see in the UV, so they see beyond the visual spectrum like we see. And so, but those don't work great, at least in my opinion. What I really like are these strings or, or strips. That's what we're using on campus. And it works really well. It just gives them that depth perception to know the windows there. Um, you know, in some really large buildings, they use screens or netting, but I really think strips work better. Um, and then, you know, the lights out program, you know, we had the, um, a good example of this is McCormick Place in downtown Chicago or along the lakefront. So they would leave the lights on all night because I thought it looked cool. And the next morning, a guy's job was to, to walk around with a wheelbarrow and fill up a wheelbarrow with dead birds because they fly into there. Um, luckily, years ago, we were able to talk with Mayor Daly and his wife was into birds. And so Mayor Daly told him to stop it. And now they get maybe one or two birds a night. So, um, but that for most of you living, um, unless you're living in a high rise in Chicago, it, that's really not a problem. Um, hawks and owls. So lots of people um, don't like these things. So I have a Cooper's hawk in my backyard that eats birds. I get lots of calls about, you know, I'm doing all this work to help my birds and that get, all get eaten by Cooper's hawk. Well, my typical response is they're part of a healthy, healthy ecosystem. We're really lucky in North America. If you go over to Europe and try to find a hawk over there, I mean, good luck. So I was over there years ago for a conference and I had to go to Stonehenge. Um, I couldn't hardly find a bird in London. Uh, if you go to Asia, I mean, there's just no raptors there because there's no birds to eat because there's just nothing left. Um, and so we're really lucky in North America that we can have, you know, you can go to Lakeshore Drive in Chicago and see 30, 40 species, you can go to Central Park. I mean, you just don't do that in most of the world, right? So 
Um, I spent days in London. I saw two species, a pigeon and then a, a type of finch. Um, I had a friend that was over in Asia and, and uh, Beijing, and they saw one bird the entire time, and they saw it die. It was flying along, being kind of um, messed around with kids, and just fell over dead. Um, so we're lucky to have these things. You know, it's part of an ecosystem. There's really not much you can do to stop the Cooper hawks or even great horned owls from being in your yard. And so, you know, you know it's just circle of life, right? They're gonna eat a few of your birds. Um, they're gonna raise their own young. It's just the way it is. Um, so what might the future hold? Uh, people can change and birds can change. Um, so one thing that um, thinking about your yard is messy is okay, right? So cultural change. So not mowing everything, having some no mow areas, having some shrubs, um, you know, urban areas are important areas for wildlife. If you look at throughout the Midwest, the areas that spend the most money for conservation, it are their counties that are urban, right? So if you look in Illinois, Lake County, McHenry County are spending, you know, as much money on land acquisition as the DNR. Um, and then, um, yeah, I was just reading where in Wisconsin, Dane County, which is where Madison is, their budget for land conservation and land preservation is more than the DNR has for the entire state of Wisconsin. And so these urban areas are important. Um, you know, conservation is tied to appreciation in nature. And one of the things we deal with here on campus is a lot of our students come and are interested in conservation and the environment um, and horticulture, but they really have no experience being out there and, see, and understanding how it all works. And so we have in our department, we have a lot of classes that we call field classes to get people out in nature. Um, to kind of appreciate there, not be scared of it, to understand how it all works. And then, so we can change, right? But also birds can change. So this is an example of chipping sparrow and field sparrow. So I would bet most of you have chipping sparrows in your backyard, but um, in the early mid 60s, they were a pretty rare bird. Um, field sparrows were much more common. Now field sparrows aren't. So chipping sparrows decided somewhere in the 70s, early 80s, why am I trying to make it in natural prairies? I'm going to go live in someone's backyard and nest in their blue spruce and eat their feeder and hang out, you know, in their yard. And their populations are going nearly exponential. Field sparrows decided I'm not going to move into urban areas and they're slowly declining because we're losing more and more natural areas over time. Another example is with morning doves. So we have some data from 100 years ago in Illinois and they were kind of everywhere in Illinois, but they weren't at very high density. Between 1900s and 1950s, they decided they went from not occurring in urban areas to saying, well, I should live in towns. And their you know, population was exponential. Um, Cooper talks, right, were endangered in Illinois years ago because they only lived in very big forests. And then they changed, you know, the birds, whether it could be cultural adaptation or evolution, but regardless, they changed. And that led to um, uh, the moving into towns. Um, a little bit about pollinators, right? So rethinking what we're doing. Um, you know, pollinators, insects are really declining. And so getting a lot of flowering plants out in your yard that flower different times a year, um, I think it's great, you know, thinking about, you know, not even having a traditional mowed yard, just trying to, I mean, it is actually more work to some degree, and there's obviously ordinances in some areas, but it's kind of rethinking, right, cultural change, rethinking what we want to have in our yard, I think is important. And going forward, we see a lot of interest in this. So what's the future of, of, of backyards, right? So greater species diversity, more importance for conservation education, right? So um, as we move, you know, we try to save whatever we have in Illinois, but, you know, there's just not resources to buy more areas and restore more prairies. So where the conservation is going to be is where people are at. So it's going to be in urban areas in your backyards. And every little step matters, right? Every little bit of habitat will contribute to populations making it. That Swainson's rush that we were tracking across the Gulf of Mexico that's breeding in Ontario and it's wintering in the Amazon, it's going to spend, I mean, I almost guarantee every one of you have Swainson's rush in your yard. It's going to spend a day in your yard. And during that day, it needs to get fat. If it doesn't get fat, it won't be able to go very far that next night. And then, you know, it's going to be kind of behind the, behind the curve. And by the time it gets to, and it's fine, it can make it, you know, from say Rockford to, you know, Champagne in the night without too much fat. I mean, it doesn't take too long. But if you're going to fly 24 hours straight across the Gulf of Mexico, a thousand kilometers straight, there's nowhere to land and you don't have the fat, you're going to die. It's just, there's, there's just no other way around it. And so every little bit of habitat can contribute to a few. And you think about how many people are out there how many people can do a little bit, and it really adds up. So again, every little bit helps. So there's about 1.5 million acres of protected areas in Illinois, 20 million acres of corn and soybeans, 
And I don't, I couldn't figure out how many million acres of backyards, but there's a lot, right? And so we know that over the last uh, 50 years or so, we've lost about 2.5 billion birds. Um, you know, we're not get, you know, we are working with farmers on corn and soybean production, those kind of things. Um, but really where the potential lies is with you guys in your backyards and, um, you know, trying to provide a little more habitat for these birds. Um, you know, and then, you know, again, on this context of the pandemic, I was talking about eBird, here we are out doing some work, but, um, you know, interestingly about conservation in local areas, the, um, I don't have all the data right in front of me, but if you look at all the referendums that happened when the election happened um, in November, um, the uh, generally they all passed, right? Reintroducing wolves to Colorado. There's all, so lots of people want more natural areas around where they live. And so that's gonna translate into more natural areas in your backyard. And so again, planting native plants, having more structure, doing it the right way can really, you know, if you do it, that's great. If your whole block does it, you know, there's a there's an additive effect there that's more than the sum of its parts. Um, so I know I covered a lot. I probably went fast. Um, the uh, feel free to contact me uh, if you have questions. There's lots of resources out there on um, birds and and putting um, you know backyard friendly bird um, ideas. Um, you know, there's not a a simple solution for everybody's backyard. Um, you know, the size, what you want to do, you know, for me, my kid, I have kids in college and high school. And so for years I had to have areas to play softball and soccer and those kind of things. Now I, I don't as much. So now it's, I'm reclaiming some of that grass to, to be into nature. And so this depends, right? So, but I think in every case, there's things you can do. And so I'll finish with this picture. This is Evening Grow Speaks. Again, a really great year for Evening Grow Speaks in Illinois. Um, a bird that's really declining and a bird that'll come to your backyard and take advantage of um, box elder seeds and sunflower seeds. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, whether they're in a chat or however Nikki wants you to, to ask questions. Yes, thank you, Mike, for the presentation. If anybody has um, questions, go ahead and either enter them in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask your questions. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box yet, but. Um, so there's a question about how uh, the best way to hang a birdhouse from a tree. Um, so I like attaching the birdhouses to a tree if you can. If you have to hang it, depending on the species of bird you're looking for, some of them are not gonna like bird, um, them swaying. And so the more you can anchor it, the better, essentially it comes down to. House wrens, sometimes you can get by with it because they're so little, but like bluebirds, chickadees, those kind of things, you definitely need to uh, anchor it as best you can. So question about oriole feeders and, and how long to leave them out. Um, so I don't, again, I don't think you're gonna impact migration. And so you, I would leave, them out through May. I mean, if you, you can leave them out longer because you're going to have some breeding in your area. Um, but I don't think there's a hard, fast rule about that. It's not like you're going to uh, impact them one way or the other by doing that. Um, they're going to again show up last for uh, Northern Illinois last week of April, first week of May. How far should speeders be spaced apart? Well, you do get some pissy birds, right? So you get uh, blue jays that are being defensive. Um, what I do, I essentially try to move them as far apart as possible in my yard. At the same time, I want to be able to see them from my um, dining room table. And so that's what I did. Um, so mine are maybe 40, 50 feet apart. The farther apart you put them, um, the, the less you reduce competition. So you'll notice that bird feeders where um, you have, especially like in cardinals, you have the stud males that are dominant over the subordinate males and they're all kind of beating up on them. So if you get them more chances, it gives more opportunities for the subordinates to feed. But really, I don't know if it makes a huge difference, but that's essentially what I do that way I can see more birds. The best way to attract Orioles is a question. So putting out a slice of, uh, putting an Oreo uh, um, uh, orange in half is a good way of getting them out there. But 
um, like I have them nesting in my um, in my yard, and um, you know I just I happen to have a couple of big sycamores and tulip trees, and you know if you have decent sized trees, oral populations are actually doing pretty good, um, and so and I don't put out oranges or anything like that, and so just having decent sized trees can go a long way to get Orioles out there. Um, yard water and yard. So um, what? So as these birds migrate all night. Um, those that have taken physiology courses. So they have a very high metabolism, which means that birds go through water at a very high rate. And one of the reasons birds migrate at night is because typically it's more humid at night. And so that's why if you put a water feature out in your yard, like a little bird bath or a little running water um, during you know, May, you'll get lots of birds coming there because they need water. Same thing in winter when all the water's frozen up, having a little bird bath for water can be, um, they'll really enjoy that. Now, of course, it's real, probably not making a difference on the population level. It's just for your enjoyment. So if you put a water feature out, um, lots of birds will really take advantage of that. Um, you do got to be a little careful about diseases, but just cleaning it out a couple times a year, I think. Um, if the water is moving, you probably won't have much problem with diseases. Um, so flowers to attract birds. I mean, there's a whole bunch. Um, trumpet vines are good for hummingbirds. Um, the, you know, Essentially, any um, flower that has kind of a, a large um, flower, a large corolla, the, that, those will work for hummingbirds. Uh, you know, in the tropics, there's a lot of different birds that have evolved to different flowers. But here in Illinois, almost all flowers are, are good because if they're not going to attract um, hummingbirds, they're going to support insects, which is then going to support your bird population. Pearl martins. Pearl martins are uh, breeding pearl martin houses. Um, you know, they probably used gourds back when the Native Americans were around, but now they only put pearl martin houses and they're really declining. And I just got an email a couple of days ago that they were starting to migrate north because they're a pretty early migrant and that big freeze in Texas apparently killed a lot of them. And so they, if you want to put a pearl martin house out, that's great. To get them there, um, what was I using these? So you need a big open area is best. And again, having a, a getting them pretty high. So putting a pole on the ground, um, you know, putting that pole in there good with their concrete and then having it pretty high out and keeping the house sparrows out. So once the pearl martins get established, they'll keep the, pearl, the house sparrows out, generally speaking. You also need to clean the house out every year. So they have these houses that are on pulley systems where they'll slide down the pole instead of you have, having to drop the pole down. So, um, yeah, pearl martins are definitely a species where they're really um, tied close to humans as opposed to other species. And so we can really help them out by putting up pearl martin houses. Now, it, it might take them a year or two to find it as well. Um, yeah, someone's talking about putting the UV stickers on their windows, which is, again, a great idea. Um, you know, that's interesting. And so I, we've done a little bit of research on this. So birds see in the UV, so you'd think they would see the stickers really well, but depending on like the angle of the sun, sometimes it doesn't work as well as you might expect. It's not like they see a big like stop sign right there, right? Um, when they do hit the window, you know, we get a lot of calls about, I have a bird that's injured, what should I do? Um, keeping it warm, um, essentially the best you can do. And then hopefully it flies away. Sometimes they don't. Um, there is, you know, where we're at, we have vet med, um, there is recover, um, places that will take them for recovery. Uh, we've done a little work with birds that have been taken to like a wildlife rehab center and then let go. A lot of them still don't do very good in the long run. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I've had birds for sure that have hit my window. Uh, I pick them up, make sure they stay warm, keep them, you know, in a safe spot. And then they essentially it's kind of like a concussion, right? They um, eventually kind of get their wits around them and fly away. And I don't know if they survive or not, but they, they definitely fly away. Yeah, so someone's talking about um, having cleaned the windows. That's great, right? So essentially that's what it comes down to is that the birds, if they can see the window, they won't run into it. And so maybe the trick is, I don't clean my windows very often either. So maybe that's a trick. Um, and on campus, the problem is I know the windows are so big and there's so much light behind them that they just, um, you know, most of our windows aren't, you know, the size of some of the ones on campus. 
and essentially putting the strips on essentially makes all the world difference. And you know, not all birds are equally likely. The white-throated sparrows, for some reason, are terrible about flying into into our windows on campus, and along with Tennessee warblers. And so we'll see this year now that we've changed the um, how we're uh, putting the we're putting those strips on the windows if, if it makes a difference or not. Um, a couple more questions. How do I attract owls? So owls are certain owls are getting more common, certain ones aren't. So great horn and barred owls are getting more common, but they need big trees. And so there's really no easy way to get them if you don't have big trees. Um, screech owls will live in smaller trees, but their populations are declining. Um, this person says they have a ravine with white oaks, and honey locusts. Uh, that's good. Um, they don't, there are owl houses, but not for the owls around us. Um, so typically owls use old crow nests and then kind of build on top of it. So there's really not much you can do. Um, obviously most of the owls, barred owls and great horned owls eat lots of small rodents. So having your yard that has a lot of um, structure that supports, um, you know, shrews and bulls, those kind of things are uh, good. I mean, a lot of people don't like to have structure that they think is going to attract mice into their house. Um, though I think it could be argued whether uh, having structure actually leads to more mice in the house. Um, a question about a bird feather. So um, theoretically, it's illegal underneath the Migratory Bird Act to hold and to um, have possession of a feather from a migratory bird. Though I do know the person that enforces that um, for Illinois, well, it's a huge political saga, right? So the last administration stopped enforcing it, but um, the new administration has started enforcing it again. But the person in charge of it, you know, they're not going to prosecute you for having a, a feather of a, you know, blue jay in your house. Um, the law, part of the law is meant for illegal harvesting of like bald eagles to sell to make fake Native American imagery. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was meeting with Fish and Wildlife up in the Quad Cities, and um, I was supposed to meet them at a spot. We we're going to do some bird counts. They called up my cell and said, we got an emergency, and I can't talk. I had to run. I'm like, well, whatever. So later, I found out that they somebody had pulled over a uh, truck that had a, a topper on the back, and in the back, they found five dead, freshly shot bald eagles. They were driving along the river shooting bald eagles to take the feathers and make it into Native American um, imagery stuff that was obviously fake. Um, and so, you know, you don't think about this still going on today, but it does. And so the, the law is meant for that kind of issues where you got five dead bald eagles you just shot in your back of your truck. It's not because you have a blue jay feather hanging from your rearview mirror. The materials for the window strips, so there's two types. One is this like a cotton fabric. So it hangs outside and kind of moves a little bit with the wind. The other is this like a ribbon that it's got an adhesive that you attach to the, to the windows. Um, we've used the ones that are kind of fabric. Um, they're okay, they get dirty and that kind of stuff. And you gotta replace them occasionally, but they seem to be working. But those strips are less, um, well, probably last longer and are less kind of obvious when you're looking out and kind of get used to them. Yeah, the small solar fountains and bird baths I like because you want to keep the water moving and that'll reduce the um, buildup of, you know, algae or other types of um, potential diseases. Um, and those little solar fountains, um, I've seen those as well. I think they probably work fine for that. Um, you know, birds are pretty dirty, right? So if you catch some birds, especially ground dwelling birds, and so they come and wash up in your feeder, it's amazing how dirty your bird feeder gets pretty quickly. And so it's good to clean it out and give, good to keep the water keep um, moving. Mike, I had someone um, direct message me a question. Um, pokeberry, is that different than pokeweed? That's the same thing. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yep. Question about global warming and what areas in the north start seeing birds typically um, in the south? So that's a great question. In fact, um, I'm hosting a researcher from University of Wisconsin tomorrow. He's giving a, a virtual talk on campus about this. Um, it's not that simple. So we have research on this. So there are birds moving farther north, like morning doves, cardinals, ribeye woodpeckers. Um, but there's also some birds in Illinois that are moving farther south. And so in Illinois, because you know today it could be 70 and tomorrow it could be 20, the birds got to deal with with weather, whatever it happens. And so what we see the movement of birds is most associated with their ability to 
deal with humans, right? Like turkey vultures, right? They're coming back earlier and earlier because they're now looking for dead stuff in people's town and towns because historically they'd be shot because people thought they were hawks. And so, but that's Illinois, right? Because we have this, you know, continental weather where it can change, you know, as you know, on a dime. If you, we have some work in the tropics in Panama, there, you know, a small, you know, uh, increase in a couple degrees makes a huge difference for the birds because they're evolved to like live between, you know, 68 and 72 degrees. It bumps up to 74 degrees and they're like in a tizzy, right? Whereas for our cardinal, they're going to be fine at 100 and a fine at, at zero, essentially. And so Illinois is kind of unique in that I don't think we're, we have issues with climate change, but they're not as big as we see in the Arctic or in the tropics. Uh, question about salted peanuts. Um, Probably. I mean, birds need salt just like we need salt. They get them different ways. I typically go, I mean, I feed sunflower seeds and pretty much that's it. So I just, they, um, most birds can, well, I also feed thistle for the finches, but um, most, if the birds can't pop them open, the birds at Cardinals that do pop them open still have to seed out anyway. Um, you know, peanuts are good for blue jays and some of the woodpeckers. Um, yeah, I don't see why salt would be a problem per se, but um, I definitely, when I go buy seed, I wouldn't get caught up on like, you know, this is a special type of seed because of this reason or whatever. I just buy, you know, there definitely is the mixed seeds I avoid because a lot of the the seeds in the mixed bag sometimes are filler seeds that birds don't like. So I, I just get sunflowers. Yes, yeah, so male rolling blackbirds get really aggressive around their nests and they will hit you. So I've been hit by rolling blackbirds before and other species and um, it's just, you know, they're so hyped up on testosterone and they're trying to defend their nest and show off to other females. So rowing blackbirds are polygynous, right? So one male will have a harem of two to eight females. And so the more stubbly he is, the more females he gets. So to some degree, the more aggressive he is, the more stubbly he is. If I missed your question, just unmute yourself and I might have missed something here. I think I got them all. I think it looks like you hit most of the questions. So we're in pretty good shape. We'll give it another minute to see if anybody else has questions. Well, that's a good question. Um, the question about feeding uh, GMO genetically modified corn a problem. Um, no, not that I've seen. No, we, we do have some issues with seed corn treated with neonicnoids. So most of the seed corn for you know growing corn in Illinois is definitely detrimental. In fact, it's outlawed for because it kills birds in Europe. But um, I think the corn, the genetically modified corn, it's generally modified mainly for um, for I don't think I mean as far as I know, people have looked at this, they haven't found an effect. Right now, all the research is on neonicnoids and trying to really pin down the impact. And I went to a meeting a couple of days ago that was very really scary in terms of the, the breadth of which these neonicnoid chemicals are throughout the entire environment. And maybe it's not causing lethal effects, it's causing sublethal effects, but you know, it's one of these things where we're trying to kind of figure it out. Well, if there's no more questions. I mean, thanks for um, thanks for the attending. And then again, feel free to email me with any kind of random question. Um, these days, I'm sitting at home working on manuscripts or administrative stuff, so it's fun to see a picture from someone's backyard and they don't know what the bird is. And I'm happy to uh, provide my identification skills. Um, or if you have questions about um, plants, you know, I'm definitely not a plant expert, but I'm happy to give my two cents. So, so again, thanks and um, and good luck. Oh, Thank someone you. Asked a question about bread. So I wouldn't put out bread. So um, it's not ideal for birds. So um, my email. So my email should be in the PDF, but it's just mpward. So Michael Patrick Ward mpward at illinois.edu.